and because I, I just go straight into the, uh, the academic aspects of, of um, the HSC. Uh, then we'll go into a support a section with Mrs. Sell, who's the um, Dean of Students of Year 11 and 12, um, who's just there, and also Mrs. Cronin, who's our school counsellor as well. You get me again with ATAR and subject scaling, which is something you can talk a lot about, but it doesn't really matter because you can't really control it, but I'll talk about it anyway. Um, and uh, Dr. Bell's going to finish with um, some UAC advice and careers, uh, and then I'll just close off and then take any questions. So just so you're aware, it is being filmed um, uh, tonight, so for those who haven't made it, um, the, the, film, the link to that will actually be available, and if you need any um, clarification on any of the points we talk about, you can watch that film as well. So uh, I'll start off with the academic requirements. And so I might um, go over here. I feel like I should be on this side rather than that side. Um, it, essentially, uh, NISA, which is New South Wales Educational Standards Authority, they provide a profile of how each student's performed in each course that they attempt. So effectively at the HSC, there's a lot of scaling and a lot of things occur to actually get your final mark. So I'm just going to go through that a bit briefly. It's, it's quite complex. Um, but effectively what happens is at the end of year 12, um, the school will send off to NISA an assessment mark. So all the assessment tasks that you do, and this is uh, talking about year 12, year 11 you still do assessment tasks, but at the end of year 11 it goes towards a ROSA, which is a record of school achievement. So you'll get at the end of year 11, um, you get a uh, ROSA, which has the grades and the subjects that you've, you've got. If you leave at the end of year 11, that's what you, you're left with. If you get to going through to year 12, that you sort of bypass your ROSA and your HSC becomes the thing that um, is what you take away from your education. Um, so at the end of HSC, you, uh, we send off uh, to NISA, we send an assessment mark based on the assessment tasks that you've done in year 12 only. Everything resets at the end of year 11. So if you've had a bit of a, a, a bad year, then you can think of it as a reset for year 12. So we're just talking year 12. An assessment mark goes off to NISA. So we don't tell you what that is um, because we could moderate it based on it. It may not be the mark that you might be able to calculate yourself. It could actually be something else. Um, then you sit the HSC exam and you get what we call a raw examination mark. So through a bit of uh, a, a large, quite a large scaling process, what will happen is that the raw examination mark is turned into, it's actually scaled. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that shortly. But effectively what happens is that the NISA will go back to the school assessment and moderate it based on your exam performance. So say for example that you uh, go not so well in the, in the assessment but your HSC mark is much higher, then it's likely that your overall mark will be scaled to be a little bit higher. And the, and the converse is true as well. So effectively the mark uh, is the moderated, the assessment mark is moderated against your exam performance. So effectively what it means is it doesn't really matter what the teacher sends off to NISA as your mark. The rank is important, but the mark is not as important because it's, it'll be moderated based on your exam performance. Then it's a 50-50 split between the moderated assessment mark and the scaled HSC mark and that's how you get your uh, HSC mark, and then you put into performance bands. So band six is 90 and above, band five is 80 to 89, band four is 70 to 79, and so on. So that's when people say, oh, I'm getting a band five in this subject, or I'm getting a band six in this subject. That's what they're referring to. It's actually just going up in tens. Anything below 50 is a band one. So the raw examination mark, let's look at and see what actually really happens. And I've called this slide the truth because um, effectively the mark that you get in the HSC is actually quite a bit lower in comparison to the mark that's reported as your raw HSC mark. And over the years, as I teach physics, I've actually been able to go into looking at what we call the results analysis package. So I can go in and have a look at every single question and look at how Winsome's gone in every single question and the actual raw mark. And so what happens is that I might go, well, this, this um, I can go, this student had said that they got 70% as their exam mark in the HSC. But in fact, what they actually really got 
if you this reasonable, reasonably good line of best fit, um, basically um, they've only got about 40 or 45 percent as a raw mark in their HSC exam. So all subjects are the similar to this. So the mark that you actually get as your HSC mark, that's said to be your raw HSC mark, is actually already scaled. So they go up quite a significant, uh, quite a significant margin actually. Um, so. What happens then is the mean of the school's uh, group's assessment is adjusted to equal the mean of the exam mark. So we've got all of our school assessment marks and there's a mean mark for that. Then you've got your HSC marks, which are actually scaled, and the mean mark of that. So effectively, they go back to the, the assessment mark and moderate it based on the exam performance. So effectively, everything, the exam is really important in terms of the rank and the performance in the, in the examination. So as an example here, here are some school assessment marks. This is a small cohort. There are five students here. The lowest mark looks to be about 53, and the highest mark looks to be about 91 or 92. So that's a school assessment. And these are the marks that those students got in their exam, which are the scaled marks, OK? Already scaled, and then it's scaled again later. But you can see here that the, the top students still got about the same, a little bit higher. Uh, and this student at the, at, the, at the back here actually improved and has actually got above 65. So what will happen now is that the school assessment mark is going to be moderated so that the same average um, is the, the same average for the school assessment is what the average was for the exam mark. So whatever the exam mark average is now gets applied to the school assessment and that's called the moderated assessment mark. So the moderated assessment here, as you can see, Every, a lot of students have actually gone up there. So that's what it was before, and that's what it's there after. So very, very much looks similar to what happened in the actual HSC. You can see the exam mark, and it looks actually very similar. So a couple of things. The person who got the top assessment mark is adjusted to equal, uh, to, equal to the highest exam mark attained by any student in the group. So if you send, if we send off 92 as, a, as a, an assessment mark for the school and you get 95 in the HSC and you're ranked first, your mark will be 95. Okay. So it's adjusted um, to be there. And in most cases, the bottom uh, mark of the moderated assessment is going to be equal to the lowest exam mark obtained. Now, it's a bit more complex because sometimes it doesn't fit their bell curve, so sometimes that doesn't happen. But technically, the top and bottom marks remain the same, and everyone in between is pushed up so that the, the, the average is what you get in HSC. This is for your moderated assessment. So there are the resultant HSC marks. So just to have another look, there's our mod a school assessment, moderated assessment, and our exam mark. So they've got the exam mark and then moderated the assessment based on that exam mark. So it means that there's less emphasis on the mark for the school assessment mark. It's more about the rank. Because what happens in the exam, in your HSC, effectively um, moderates your assessment based on that exam. So the exam result is actually really important because it will then go back to your moderate assessment and then these two things make up 50-50 of your final mark. Okay, so 50% that, 50% that. So let's have a look at another example. I think this might have been in Music Mrs. Cell a couple of years ago. And these are the school assessment marks that have been sent off and they're the school rank. So the highest person is 87% and the lowest person in there got 61%. When you look at their HSC exam, you can see here that firstly, the mean of these marks was 79, the mean in the HSC was 81. So the students have gone a little bit better in, in the HSC exam than what the school assessment was. But there's another thing here, and this is why it's in red, this particular student who actually came fifth with the assessment actually got the highest HSC exam mark. They got 91. So they ranked first for the exam, whereas the person who came first in the school um, was a, got 86, pretty similar to what they got um, for the school assessment, but they're ranked second. Now, what happens is that the top ranked student in the school gets the highest exam mark, even if they didn't get it themselves. So this person who's ranked first gets that mark from this person. 
Why? Well, if you really don't apply yourself much to the assessment through year 12 and you're cruising along doing what you're meant to do and you haven't done as much work as someone who's really earned that first rank, then effectively it needs to come along and go, well, actually, this person who's worked the hardest because it's the sustained effort will get your mark. So it's a bit like doing nothing at all and then getting to the HSC, deciding to study for the exam and getting the top rank. What the thinking is, why is that fair that everyone else has worked really hard and you just get that mark based on the HSC? So that's the reason why that happens. And so effectively that person gets that. Now the HSC mark overall now is actually the HSC exam, which has been scaled quite significantly, and it's an average between those two. So you can see here now that the mean is 82. So the mean is more or less, well the mean will be more or less similar because the mean now for the moderated assessment should be about the same as the HSC exam. And it's one off, but it's yeah, more or less the same. And there are the HSC marks there. So that is an average of the exam mark and the moderated assessment mark. So, no. No, there's a couple of marks you don't see, Jane. You don't see um, the mark that we sent off to NISO. You never see that actual mark. And you never see the raw HSC mark. What the mark was. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right. So that, well, the HSC exam, it, it, overall, because effectively what will happen is because your assessment marks are low, it's going to be a, an average of those two. So this person ended up getting 84, which is higher than what their school assessment was, but it's halfway in between their exam. So the student gets to see the No, they, they don't see that one. So yeah. with the, with the, the mark we send off to Nisa, they, um, students never see, but they know the rank. So they know where they came. But that, that mark they never see. They will see this one and they'll see that one, and they'll see that one. Sorry? They won't know the mean, I don't think it's showed either, no, no. So, and the, the other thing they don't show also is what they really got in the HSC exam, which is what I, I showed there before. Um, but teachers, as teachers, we can go into the results package and actually see that, that this student got 72, the HSC exam was, well, 86, but actually that was probably about 50 or 60 or something like that as a raw mark. So initially, like a couple of years ago, before this became available, we thought that students were really working hard after they finished term three and they were making these incre increasing their marks, basically, by a significant margin. But what it was, was that the, there was also some scaling going underneath that as well too. And there, there are various reasons for that um, exam difficulty, the different cohorts that, that uh, might be in each um, subject. Um, so there are some other reasons why they do that. But that's just an extra bit of scaling that people don't see. Mm. But in the end, uh, I, I reiterate what I said at the start, there's not much you can do about it. <laughs> like this is the way that it's done. So all you can do is the best that you can do and try to get that the top rank because you're going to be the least affected by anything else that goes on. So if you've got the top rank, you get the top exam mark. So if Joe decides to do nothing all year and then suddenly just gets his amazing 98%, that's yours because you tried the hardest through the year. Okay. So in terms of the different um, uh, subjects, and the, the average is a different for each subject. And that's mainly because the cohorts that do each of those subjects is, are different. If you do, students that do music or do art are also usually very, very good at that. So on average, their marks are higher than students that might do general maths, which is now um, standard, or PDHP or some of those other ones as well. Sciences are also reasonably low, but they're mixed in with the humanities subjects as well. Interestingly, English math, English advanced students actually go really well overall. So this is the average. So if you're getting 72%, in English, you're below average. The average is 80. Okay. Extension subjects, naturally, would be much higher because those are the very capable students that are doing extension subjects to get that. So ultimately what that means is that 80% in one subject is not the same as an 80% in another subject. Okay. So I'll come back to that. 
and I'll just hand over to Sue and uh, Kathy for student support. Do you want to drive? All right. Do I have to put that on? You can if you like. Oh, well, it's being filmed, so yes. Yeah. Do you really? Okay. Well, I feel you. like I'm on the Today Show. <laughs> Do I look at the camera and speak happily? Is everyone befuddled? Or are you clear as mud? You're befuddled. <laughs> Why are you befuddled, Kate? Oh, they just have to try really hard. That's all they can do. They have to try. That's all they can do. We can talk about this all day long. If you have a red eye, you've got a red eye. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the important is the rank. So, and the take home message is that the first rank is really important. But even the second rank, being high for the first person, will also have a problem. So, that's the issue. So, um, trying hard over time. 18 years ago, you look like this. Oh, I'm into babies at the moment, or this, or this. Sometimes this. Hopefully you won't think look like that too much this year. Um, one thing Sue and I have sort of thought through in terms of thinking about the HSC is it's helpful to think that it's a marathon. So it's about sustaining something over time, your output over time. It's about your rank and it's about finishing. So if you think about what you need to do a marathon, that is a good way of thinking about your well-being, about your goals, about managing stress, how to get there, all those really important things. Is that right, Sue? Yeah. You, yeah. If you stand on the on the start line and go, can't do this, can't do this, don't want to, can't do this, I'm never any good at this. How do you think you'll go? Winnie? Not very well. Not very well. What's really important is a growth mindset. Do you want to say something to that? Well, Come this way. The growth mindset <coughs> is the opposite of a fixed mindset. So we can kind of think, I just can't do that. But you just have to change that to think, I can't do that yet. So it's developing that mindset that it's going to take effort, it's going to take persistence, it's going to take dedication, it's giving it a red hot go and doing the best you can to improve and let that mind expand and you can go on and I can improve my performance with that continual effort. So that's what it's about. Yeah. It's not about just going, nah, shut down, can't do this. Yeah. Don't want to do it, don't care. It's about... So a couple of those sheets were about growth mindset. I would like to improve my academic performance and important next to that is I believe I can. So, but alongside that is that our students who did the dots, the poor three that were here early, um, have said they've, they've actually feel like they're quite high up there in what their performance has been over the last year. So um, someone says, no, I, I believe I, they don't think they can improve their academic performance but because that might be because they feel like they are giving it the reddest, hottest go they can. But it's important if you're struggling to have that mindset where you believe that you'd like to improve and that you believe you can or you have the skills to get help to work out how you can. One of them is good habits. And that most important habit I think we need to address for our students is their online world. So we do have parents that don't waste much time online, but we do have one that wastes a lot of time online all the time. Um, it'd be interesting to see how that person manages their life or how they can pull it back as a grown-up. But with our students, where have we got the online one? Right there in the middle. I waste a lot of time on no and a couple of yes. So Part of getting through this marathon is forming a habit around your online world. And that might be something we can do in stage meetings, etc., to really help you think about that and get into habits. Because habits give you cues <coughs> that make actually doing your habit and having a routine easier. I know I'm going fast. We need to have a strong, healthy body. So, 
a lot of your grown-ups do exercise quite well. I think that's a very good result for a group of grown-ups. Um, so we had here that some of you, some of yes, yes, and sort of half-half. Um, in terms of managing stress and training for a marathon, exercise is key. And to try to get that, once again, as a habit in your life, that will help you with the stress and it will actually, I firmly believe, helps you with your performance as well. So getting those marks. Athletes need a lot of sleep. No grown-ups get enough sleep here except for one. Okay. Um, but how do you go? So, where is it? Yep. Oh, girls. You're ripping it. Yeah. One of the problems that our community faces is a lot of fatigue in our young people, um, whether that's online world, whether it's stress, whether it's anxiety, but starting to get really good sleep hygiene, especially through exam periods and leading up to exam periods. If on your, uh, during your exam time, if you sleep until midday because you don't have an exam and you're used to doing that, then doing a 9 hour, a nine a.m. three hour exam the next day, it's like you're jet lagged, you're just disadvantaging yourself. So getting good sleep hygiene is really important. You don't need to be fit to run a marathon, but you need to be an iron person. So getting exercise, oh, that's the exercise one. Okay, understand avoidance traps. So procrastination. We have some procrastinators amongst our parent body. How did we girls go? I should have done it in a way that I could. We procrastinate, where are you? Ah, oh. oh. no? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So sort of never. Working on procrastination is really once again about habit forming in the way you talk to yourself. So. If you go, I'm not in the mood right now, I need a break. Hear that? I used to hear that a lot and I just had to zip it with my children. But starting to think about how you self-talk, what you say to yourself is crucial in procrastination. Um, I think I'll tidy my room. That's an interesting one, but that's one that one of my sons used to do. No, I'm tidying my room, so that is off my back. I'm doing something worthwhile, but just not my work. So working out whether you fit into these. Perfectionism might mean that you really want to do the right thing, you want to do it really well, but if you don't understand it or you're scared of giving it a go, you sort of put it off and that's a trap. So starting to think through how you can change from I don't understand it, I'll wait, I'll get help later, to I'll make a start and see how I go. A lot of that is about self-talk, and avoidance is often about self-talk. I'll do it tomorrow, doesn't matter, I've got plenty of time, all those kind of things. This is key, I think, in the HSC, it's chunking. So if you stand at a marathon and think about the kilometres and kilometres ahead of you and the end line, you can feel overwhelmed. So I know that when I run and I'm tired and fatigued, I don't think about where I'm going to end. I go, I'll run to there, and then I'll run to there, and then I'll run to there, and then I'll run to there, and see how I go. So learning how to chunk work, so the content of the work, you would have done that already in your years leading up to now, so you get an essay knowing how to chunk it. But importantly in the HSC is also chunking your time. So you might have a two-hour session of prep, and you think about how I'm going to chunk that down to time where I can actually be on task and then have a break and then be on task. I think timers are great for that on your phone. You set the timer, give yourself exam conditions, do a 20 minute run. Did you want to say anything more about that, Sue? Yeah, we're going fast. Yeah, but chunking is key. And helping your children chunk is key. Now this, uh, I, I love this photo. Um, Athletes know who their white knights are. To have a supportive cohort, to have a supportive team around you, people that will help you. And I actually love our 
our year 12 feel here is really supportive of getting each other through because the better everyone does, the better everyone does. <laughs> Which is double think. But what is important is actually also fairness. And obviously this person amputee needs special help and special needs and special support. And it's obvious. But in our cohort, there'll be people that will need special help with special needs, with special situations that is not visible to anybody else. And that can be really hard. Um, it can be hard for the cohort to understand and um, we try to really help you as much as we can to understand what's going on for each other and um, how we support kids who are going through tough stuff. Now, this gets me on to the important things about misadventure. So in the HSC year, if something um, detrimental happens to you, you can apply for a misadventure. And that's, um, let me make sure I get this right, this is about the day. So if you can't hand in an assessment task for a reason the night before your roof was blown off at Threadbow and you hadn't finished it and the computer went dead and you hadn't thrown it in, that's a misadventure. Most misadventures in New South Wales HSCs is on medical grounds. So on that day I had an appendicitis attack and I went to hospital and I didn't submit the work. So that's important. And uh, we will often put in misadventure claims for assessment tasks and exams. So last year we had a very unfortunate situation of a girl having a foot run over on the morning of the exam. So that's a misadventure and we apply and she gets an estimated mark. Or she gets an estimated mark and whichever is ever's better in that exam for is accepted for assessment. For Yeah, so sometimes, sometimes we'll say to kids, go and have a go, but knowing that your assessment mark will count if, um, if you go badly in it. And sometimes it's good to give it a go, even with a you know, run over foot. Um, the other thing you can apply for when you come to think of university studies is um, uh, educational disadvantage over time. So that's not about the day, that's over time. So say if you've had a really ill parent in your HSC year and they've been all over the place um, and you've missed school or et cetera because of that, we apply for you to have special consideration because you feel disadvantaged around university admission. So they're two different things. Have I got that right? Yep. Yeah. The other important thing to know um, is that the HSC, we need to sign off that you have completed enough of the course to, to complete that course to be included in your HSC. So sometimes kids think that just showing up or is enough, but there is nuance about that we need to sign you off. So you have to finish the marathon, however that looks in that subject, which is important. So it's really important when it comes to um, what is happening for other people in your year group to run your own race and think about your own race and think about what's important to you. Stay focused, plan, get good habits. It's about you. That's all you can do is your best. Before you know it, the crunch has come and it is all over. This goes really fast, which is good and bad because you go, oh, what happened there? And summer rolls in and you're done. So. On to ATAR, so just to make it a little bit more complex than what it already is, and I'll try to be uh, pretty brief. Uh, again, ATAR, a little bit misunderstood in terms of what it actually is. It's actually a rank and it's not actually a mark. So it's based on an aggregate of scale marks in 10 units of ATAR courses. So re regardless of what courses you do, English is always counted as two units. So if you take uh, 12 units to the HSC of just uh, category A courses. Category B are ones that are 
effectively one we don't offer any at the school um, but the category are things like English, uh, maths, um, physics, music, all that sort of thing. Um, so you sh you've got to have a minimum of 10 units of those. Uh, but if you take 12 units, then two of them won't count. So there's one subject where if you bomb that subject for some reason or you might need it for you do the university course you want to go to but you're not going that well in it, it's still okay to keep that because it may not be included in your ATAR. But given the different types of subjects and how they scale, the subject that you think is not going to count, uh, don't count on that. <laughs> because sometimes it does actually count, even though the mark may be lower than some of your other subjects, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so English always counts, um, and they can be accumulated at a five-year period. So you can actually do your HSC over a five-year period to prolong the the whole process, but I don't know why you'd probably do that. Um, but you can, and some people have. So we've had students in the past that have done the HSC, not gone as well as what they thought they should, so they've just repeated that. And they, that you can actually repeat that again to have another go. Um, and the scale marks calculated on the year the course is completed. So let's have a look. It's called Australian Tertiary Admission Rank, and it's a position. So it's a number between 0 and 99.95, but that number is actually a position of you in comparison to everyone else that's undertaking the HSC or is actually ATAR eligible. And uh, anything below 30 is not reported, so anything above 30 is. And effectively, the reason why they have this is that universities um, attempt to rank um, school leavers and seeing where you are in comparison to your cohort across New South Wales to put you into the subjects that they think might be suitable to. So if a, sub, if a university course has an ATAR cutoff of 85, but you get like 60, then you, you might struggle in that. But it's a bit of demand as well. So a subject may be a really high ATAR, but it's because people want to do it. So so many people want to get into that. So it's, it's not necessarily the, the ability that it's a difficult course, but it's also got to do with the demand as well. And Dr. Bell's going to talk a bit more about that. So effectively controlling for the competition, determining what we call the aggregate score in the HSC, in the ATAR, um, you go into percentiles. What happens is that a lot of students have left, started in year seven and left. So all the students that have left at the end of year 11, they get pushed under you. So the ATAR average is about 70. So you think that average would be about 50, but it's actually 70 because all the students that started year seven that haven't finished year 12 get pushed under you, and so everyone goes up. And that's why the average is about 70 for the ATAR. And it's truncated to 0 .05, uh, 0.05. You can't get 100 anymore in ATAR, so they made the maximum was 99.95. Um, so that, that's the process. So you have an exam, a moderated uh, assessment mark, produced an av uh, a HSC mark, which we talked about earlier, and it's changed into a scaled mark for the ATAR. So, You've got your exam, a moderated assessment mark, which was moderated based on your exam performance, and then that's turned into your HSC mark. Um, ATAR people take your HSC mark, and then they turn it into a scaled mark. Everything scales down, except for extension to maths, which is extremely complex. So it's scaled so that it's a mark that you receive if all course candidatures were the same. So some courses are more difficult than others. So if it's, if it's, some courses will have higher marks than other marks, as I was mentioning before. But effectively what it means is in some subjects that scale worse, um, it's effectively meaning that the competition is greater. So there's more really capable students doing that course, which means that the marks are higher. And so you need to get a higher mark in comparison to another course. And it's, uh, this, it starts with the, the algorithm is, has, is based on the premise how good you are in the course and the strength of the competition. So I, I picked music or visual arts, a good example. Students that do music are really good at music, right? So they, the marks are pretty high there. So in order to get um, a, a decent um, position in that co course, you do tend to need to get a higher mark than what you might in another subject like physics, where there's some very capable students um, but the difficulty of the course and the strength of the competition is different. So effectively, each of the courses, you'll have a different cohort and different strength of that cohort. And the scaling will control for the strength of the competition. 
So I've got two here that are a good example of that. So say, for example, you've gone through all that process and you get your HSE mark, and I got 90% um, in chemistry, right? So I go down here, here's my HSE mark, and this is for, this, it hasn't really changed. I've left this as to 2013. That's a pretty good spread of years, but it effectively hasn't really changed much. If I get 90% in chemistry, um, you act come along and go, right, that gives me 85. And it's broken up into two different units, so it's actually half that. Um, so each course that you do, or most courses are two unit courses, and they turn it into two lots of, um, of a mark out of 50. But for, to make it simpler, I've just left it as a percentage. If I get 70% in chemistry, it will come down to about 55. And that's, what you, that's what's used to calculate your ATAR. If you have a look at another subject where the students who do it are ex really great at that subject and do a really good um, amount of work with it and they, their marks are a bit higher, visual arts is an example. So if I've got 90 in visual art, it actually goes down to about 75. So remember that's actually lower than what chemistry was. And if I get, uh, well, I mean it's not even on the scale, but if I get like 75% in visual art, I'm down to about 30 for the scaled mark. Because the students that are doing that course are really, really capable of it and they're getting higher marks. So as an example, we've got three students here. Student A is doing Business Studies, Design Technology, English, Maths, Modern History, 10 units. Student B is doing Biology, Chemistry, Advanced English, Maths, PDHP and Language, which was German, I think. Uh, and Student C is doing Biology, Chemistry, Advanced English, General Maths and PDHP. So let's have a look. So that's they are their HSC marks. That's what they got. This is real data. This is from a couple of years ago. So when you look at all those marks, the average mark is very similar. 74, 72, 73. So if that's if you just got all their HSC marks and just got the average. But when you go into looking at what UAC does with the with the ATAR scale mark, you can see that these marks are um, everything scales down, as I said but they're all scaled differently depending on the course that they'd actually chosen. So if you have a look at something like, I'm um, trying to think of one that's really similar. So um, modern history has gone from 75 to 50 and advanced English has gone 78 to 60. So there's a bit of a difference in, in all these subjects. Another example there, design technology, 81 has gone to 51. So some get pulled down a bit more based on the strength of the competition in those courses. Uh, maths, even though that this uh, person got 57, which was the lowest, uh, the, her lowest mark, I believe, it went down to 28. The advantage of having 12 units is this student knew that she wasn't that good at maths, but she needed it for the course that she wanted to get into. So that didn't matter because that mark is the lowest of those marks and it's not included. So remember, it's 10 units. So there's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So that one won't be included. So that's sometimes an advantage of taking 12 units, knowing that one may not count, but sometimes it may not be the one that you think is not going to count. In this case, she, she knew that she wasn't as good at math, so she knew that was likely going to be the one that's not going to count towards ATAR. So it didn't matter that she, she got a lower mark in it um, because it wasn't going to count towards her ATAR. Everyone else here, though, with 10 units, everything counts. So if you bomb one of the subjects or you're not good at one of the subjects, and that's why I always recommend when you get into uh, year 12, when we start work just a, a little bit more in term four, like midway or just a bit early, um, really think twice about coming to me and saying, I want to drop to 10 units because everything counts. You're better off keeping the 12 units, even though that subject may you may not be as good at or you're not enjoying it. It's always good to have one up your sleeve just in case. So I do when students come to me for that, I do give a bit of a stern look, and obviously it's your choice to do that, but I say you really, really want to do this because it's really important if you have 12 units, it's, it's better in some instances. So let's add those up, and these are the marks that are from the scaled ATAR mark, and these are the marks that you get. So the predicted ATAR, that's what it was predicted, and that was the actual ATAR. So you can see massive differences. So this student here that um, hedged a bet and knew that maths wasn't going to count, had 10 other units that were really good, and her ATAR is much, much higher than student C or student A. But the averages are the same. Student A got the highest average mark in the HSC with the, course, the subjects that they'd chosen, 
but the ATAR is much lower than everyone else, based on the subject that they've taken and how they went in them. Okay. And they didn't have another subject where they might have gone better to keep that 12 units to make sure that they, they could have actually got a higher ATAR. It's interesting, um, when I do, when I've done ATAR scaling in the past, when I, I'll actually give you an ATAR estimate um, twice, so not really in year 11, but in year 12. There's one about the half yearly, well, we don't have half yearly anymore, but sort of in term two. And there's one just up the trial based on those marks. And when I actually rank the students, and last year I noticed it um, specifically last year, and I have all of the students in the whole cohort um, with the ATAR, so the top ATAR student, I, I had it in Excel and I, and I sorted it, the top student and then the, the student had the lowest ATAR, and I actually color coded if they had 10 units. And essentially, the bottom half was the students that had 10 units, and the top half had the students that had 12 units. And that's got nothing to do with their ability, it was the amount of students that actually had 12 units because they had two where they could go really poorly in a, in a, in a subject, but they actually um, improved on the ATAR or had a better ATAR as a result. So really think strongly about not going to 10 units. Obviously, you know, if you have to do that, then do it, but just keep that in mind. Some people, obviously, some students have succeeded really well with 10 units. And there was, were exceptions in that table that I spoke about. Like there was one of the students who got ten, had 10 units who was in the top three of the, of the um, school. Um, but they were also really very, very good at those 10 units. I think there's two key reasons that it's really important to do well at the HSC level. And I think the first one of those is that sense of fulfillment, fulfillment that you take with you through life, knowing that you gave something your best shot and it's hard to go back and rectify that in retrospect. But the other one is obviously opportunities. The better you do, the more opportunities. And so that's a discussion I was having with Year 10 careers last week that I think remains true right through Year 11 and 12. So I just want to talk about two key areas, is the general support for careers, what's available in Year 11 and 12. And also, I just want to touch on some specific application processes for university entrance particularly. Not that we assume everybody goes from here to university, but Statistically, it's around the 85 or so percent, give or take. So typically in a cohort of ours, one or two or three students doesn't go into university, but everyone else does. So we, we do tend to gear most things that way, but recognise for the one or two or three or whatever that there are other p pathways, of course. TAFE being one of those, and the other being directly into workplace, um, school-based apprenticeships leading into, into on-workplace apprenticeships as well. So I just want to touch on each of these, and these different elements of the processes, I'll just touch on those in a little bit more detail, those dot points as we get more towards the end. But in terms of general career support, Year 11 students who we mostly have here today um, have come out of year 10, work ex uh, year 10 careers and just finished with work experience last term, presumably, even for those in other schools. And so that's a nice springboard and there's been some specific information given to students through that avenue. But I think the person or people that remain the most influential, most important through the 11 and 12 is parents actually, as careers influence, generally speaking, because nobody knows your children better than you do contextually and what's good for them. We can give specific support around a lot of different things, and we do, but I think that connection remaining with parents is really important. And it's one thing that we learned from last year particularly, where we actually took our year 12 group from last year and split them into four groups and they had a mentor, um, which was Sue, myself, Daryl, and Kelly Wilson, each took a group of about eight students each and followed them through for the year. And one of the things that we got in the habit of doing was contacting and emailing specific information to, that, to our little mentor group, and not so much parents. And one of the areas of feedback that we got from parents was we want to be included as well, and so we take that on board, which is important. And it's a delicate balance because for some, um, they want the information take, take it and run with it, and for others, parents need to be a bit closer for that support. So this year, we'll give a bit more specific support, particularly for Year 12 students, but I think this is important for Year 11 to note now. And so one change I want to mention to you uh, for Year 11s and 12s is that Chris Ryrie, our librarian, will take over some specific career support, one-to-one, -one, particularly some of the mentoring with what do I want to do as a career, and then eventually through the application process. And that's something that Chris um, is very suited to. She spends a lot of time in the library, obviously, with um, students in Year 11, 12 on spares, so it's quite easy for students to access her as many times as they like. And then there's other people here 
Sue, Daryl, myself to support the process for those who want a, an additional layer of support. The other thing I want to mention for your 11 students in particular is this opportunity to continue with work experience. Whilst it might be a week in term four, there's no reason why students in year 11 can't continue with work experience through the school. We provide our insurance to the employer and so forth. If you still want to work out what it is I really want to do or want to try some different things or even to eliminate some different options, that's still possible. And we do get a few who do that. Not many, but it is available to you. And the other one is the self-exploration there for the students. And I'm just going to touch on that a little bit more because I think uh, my observation with Year 12s who come into Year 12 and you sit down and go, what are you thinking? What's the area that you're, you would like to um, pursue a little bit more? And some students go, this course, this university, this is the ATAR I need, this is the career I'm doing, that's where I'm moving after school. I know it exactly. Not many do, but some. Through to, I have no idea. I've never even thought about it. So most are somewhere in between. But I think it's important that Year 11 students explore that question before you get to year 12, at least to have a base to go from. And so the last point here is for those who want it, and not many take this up, but there are professional careers advisors out there in the wider world, in the city areas who charge, in most cases, quite a few hundred dollars to give you specialist support and take you through the process. But I do think we do it at school anyway, but some people prefer that extra layer. I won't worry about too much of the timelines. The other element to just to put parents more in the picture, and students know this of course, is what happened in year, year 10 careers. So one thing that crept in, or made, it, made its way into our program a few years ago was the personal, personality profiling element. So different Myers-Briggs type studies, VIA, VIA significant strengths, so the Penn University type of personality profiling, to give a bit more of a platform and a bit more insight into the person because of course as we get older we develop that knowledge um, eventually, but as a young person it's really hard to have a base for that. So that's really just there to open up that world of thinking for younger people. And then some pragmatic elements around resume writing and so on and so forth. Um, and if time permits right at the end is, is that introduction into applying for university courses to start that exploration process. For Year 11 and 12 where you're more interested in where you're going, um, there will be some group meetings about these procedures, which again I'll get into a bit more detail in a minute. Uh, throughout the, the year, but particularly for Year 12, because they're at the pointy end of needing to actually go through the processes, but there's no reason why Year 11 shouldn't start that uh, individually as well. And the one-to-one -one counselling that I mentioned, of course. And then the university visits. Now, we just had Year 12 go to the University of Wollongong last week, but in discussions, we think that Year 11 might benefit from that more. And so we're trying to shift that to Year 11 so that some of these elements of thinking can occur a bit earlier and also not be as disruptive for Year 12. So we're working towards that. <coughs> Here are just some time frames <coughs> which actually um, are worth noting. So Year 12s, for instance, and if you're in Year 11 to note this for next year, Year 12 will meet soon in a few weeks to start this official process and formal process of application, which will continue as well as as much support as students need. Now, if we take it last year as, as an example, some students saw us once, some we had to chase all through the school to get to pin down and come and see us, and others saw us on a weekly basis for months on end, uh, and just wanted to keep the conversation going, keep testing things, keep asking for advice. And so we have all sorts of presentations, but you can have as much support as you need. Um, and then in April, uh, we start to take Year 12s through the process of the early entry, what's, what used to be called early entry, so the school recommendation scheme and the EAS applications, which again I'll talk about in a minute. Now I've put there August as the group registration processes, but talking with UAC today, I believe they're bringing that forward to April. For many, many years they've opened that up in the first, usually the first Wednesday in August, but they're bringing that, appears to be what they've told me verbally today, bringing that back to April. So I just need to double check that, that that's the case. So this is my advice to your 11 students and parents is to go in and have a look at the UAC website, or if you're interested in Victoria, VTAC or Queensland, QTAC, just put that, or South Australia and so on. They're all separately applied for. So you can apply for each state in Australia, but note Canberra or ACT is part of New South Wales for this purpose. But go into the page and just click on future applicant, and then there's a heap of information in there that you can read through yourself. I'm just going to jump to the middle column in terms of applicant information, how to apply, 
the SRO scheme and so on. There's a, a ton of information in each of those. So for instance, with the school's recommendation scheme, the early entry, there's a whole booklet on that. And the same for the educational access scheme, there's a whole booklet on that alone, as well as different dot points that, that take you through that. So if you read all of that information, you'll be well equipped with as much as you need to know. And then you can just touch base with us if you're not sure, or ring them direct yourself. Um, the, if you click on the undergraduate for courses, it will take you into the course, the course searches, and then you can drill down a little bit more on specific courses. There's about 2,300 different undergraduate courses, so that's quite a lot to wade through. So narrowing it down is, is quite important. And then there's a bit more information to the side here. This is a, a, an older page from a previous year, but this was one of the key landing pages for students in year 11 and 12, which was they could um, click on your application, they so you start the application process through there, and it's fairly intuitive. It steps you through how to apply once it opens up. And once you apply, it remains open, so you can keep going back and making changes as often as you like. Uh, had the search courses, and then the other key one here was to also later on check applicate, sorry, check um, offers and different elements of where you're up to in the stage of, of the processes. So this was an important page for um, for students in Year 12 in particular, and things like the UAC PIN and those sorts of things they get sent to you early in Year 12, and it's really important that the address is correct on those because they get sent. Home to you, get sent to your home address for borders in particular to note. And if there's any errors, you need to pick that up fairly early. When you do that too, just as a matter of interest, parents often don't know this, but students get to make a choice whether they share you and include you in the information or lock you out of it. And, and to be honest, it's about half and half. So it really is um, part of you and your relationship and how you want to go about that. And some prefer to keep it private and others want their parents to be very much part of that process. So that's a family preference, of course. If you search the courses, this is the part that keeps changing. So for the parents who are uh, you know, second, third time parents for year 11 and 12, which there are a number in the room, these, these continue to change a little bit. So it's worth being up to date with some of those. And one of the things that's been uh, put in very recently is a, tr is a government transparency element to these, and it's further down here in this page on this screenshot, which, which tells you the lowest ATAR and selection rank that students got to get offered a place in that, which never, which like raw marks used to be all hidden and you didn't really know. So now that transparency is there and you can get in and have a look at what actual ATAR, what was the lowest ATAR, the mean ATAR and the highest ATAR that students got as part of that course entry. And I should probably use the terminology selection rank because ATAR is, as Dr Nelson said, the, the raw component of what you get and then there's the potential to get selection bonus points on top of that, ATAR bonus points, which sit on top. So not part of the ATAR, but they layer on top of it. And so, for example, um, by going to school here, students will get a bonus, get some bonus points at most of the institutions in New South Wales, not all, for going to school in a rural location. So that's an example of those, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and so the CSP is the, the Commonwealth Supporter Place, which is um, ubiquitous for all of the Australian citizens. Overseas play, places are different. Four years, the different elements of the ATAR. And one of the things that's also changing is the differences with the course start dates. So you can, you'll start to see more and more who have semester two entry. Uh, and there's even now some moving to trimesters. So that's changing again. And why that's relevant is because the old gap year that students used to do before they started, which was very popular, is now uh, has, has some other um, adaptability to maybe go in July and have a effectively an eight month gap year instead of a whole year. So there's diff different elements to consider for that. Um, Dr Nelson talked about prerequisites um, and was quite right in saying generally they were removed from universities remove those for courses. We're starting to see a little creep back in for those. So it was all about assumed knowledge um, and admission criteria here. So I talked about assumed knowledge of HSC extension by maths for this course. So this was a Bachelor of Science at the University of Sydney, but now we can see they've brought in prerequisites for, for mathematics and a band four or higher, which is, a, which is a change in the last couple of years that that's starting. So just be aware, when you go in to these, if you click on any particular course and bring up information about that course, it's all, it's all in the, the fine print for each one. And so that's why I say students in year 11 should go in and just explore and just play with these and have a look and see what's, what's there. 
In terms of dates, again, it's a little bit important to be, um, to be aware of these. More so for Year 12s, not as much for Year 11 at this stage, but to be aware for Year 11. So, uh, as I said, it's typically been open in the start of August, but we think it might be April this year, so we've just got to confirm that. Um, but the, the SRS, the early entry applications, are also going to be open earlier as well, therefore. And they close at the end of September, usually the last Thursday or Friday in September, and there's no late fee, there's no late element to those. So once they're closed, they're closed. And be aware, not every institution goes through UAC to process early entry. Some are direct. University of Wollongong is a good example, and they close five weeks earlier than UAC, UAC do for early entry. So a lot of students miss out on University of Wollongong early entry because they've missed the, the, the date. So it's important to get those dates down somewhere in your diaries. Um, UAC are a bit more forgiving in terms of late entries beyond that last Thursday or Friday in September, except you pay a lot more for it. So your, your fee, the fee goes from about $70 to $200 for being late, so it's worth being on time. Um, there's 20 or so different round offers. Most of those uh, are not so relevant. Some are. Um, for students in Year 12 going into the process for university, there's probably about six or eight that are relevant of those. Some are uh, through portfolio, some are international students. There's a whole host of different elements to those. But the key ones to note are uh, the, this one here, the early entry. Students get early entry offers from September through to early December if they apply for it. And how you apply for it is really simple these days. It's very, very different to say seven years ago. And it used to be called the Principal's Recommendation Scheme. And you'd write all these pages, what a wonderful student they were, and all these different elements and achievements. And it's been uh, eroded over time now. It's just part of, part of the process when they apply for a course. It's in that process and they click on the early entry, answer some questions. They don't have to do it a lot at all. Very minimal effort. And then the real benefit for that is that you basically get two offers because you get your early entry offer if you're successful to an, to an institution. We're now finding in the last two years some students are getting two early entry offers to two different institutions. And then you get your main round offer here. So you're actually getting multiple offers. And that's a change over the last few years that didn't used to occur. So that's the real benefit for, um, for early entry. You get a, another bite of the cherry, so to speak, which I think is worthwhile. And I don't know why more students don't do it. There are, <coughs> there are a couple of institutions that don't offer it. And that would be, of course, one reason. But otherwise, if they do, I don't know why you wouldn't go through the process. So EAS, I talked about that. Just to finish, EAS and SRS. So EAS, the Educational Access Scheme, um, allows for students who have some disadvantage. And this is for university entrance, not HSC. So what Mrs. Cronin was talking earlier about HSC, that's over there. This is just purely for application to university. And so when they say long term, they mean generally six months or more. And so there are, um, there are eight main categories. And there's about 25 different types within the categories. And the ones in the red there are, are, the, uh, are the different categories. And so some of those don't relate to us, and some may well. And in fact, every year we have students who apply for this every year and are successful. And what students get out of this, if they're eligible, of course, are those ATAR bonus points. So for instance, some instant, and the way it works is UAC are a, are a warehouse, if you like, to process all of this for, for the institutions, but the institutions then impose different rules for their own university and what they do with that information. So for example, as I mentioned before, school environment, this one here, where there's bonus points on the ATAR for being in Jindabyne, because we're more than, uh, less than 10,000 population and more than 100 kilometres to the major city, that one's actually automatically applied. It's the only one that is automatically applied. But for some institutions, that could be four bonus points or five bonus points on top of the ATAR, um, and some others don't recognise it at all for us. But they might for other schools that are in certain other regions. So that's, that's where we come in a little bit to help advise on whether those institutions do or don't apply, for, apply that. And the same here too. So disrupted schooling, for instance, and this applies to some students we've got in the room right now, um, if students change schools in year 11 and 12, then you can be eligible for EAS and you might get bonus points on your ATAR for changing schools during year 11 and 12, for instance. Um, or a student who's gone to three schools across year 11 and 12. 
Um, if parents down here, if parents separate in year 11 or 12, it doesn't have to be divorce, but just separate, then, then there's potential bonus points there for that educational adjustment for the impact that has on the student in their learning over those, or for six months or more of that period of time. Um, excessive care responsibilities. Sometimes we've got young people or elderly people that students look after um, excessively. And so those are the sorts of things that um, can, be, can be claimed. And this one here is the other one, which is physical disability, psychological, psychiatric, um, any medical and physical element or sensory one, I think I didn't mention, um, can all be applied for. Now some of these require a lot of documentation and so starting the process early because it involves medical practitioners supporting the, the information is the case for some and others it's very straightforward with very minimal documentation needed. So that's worth looking at and just reading through the, the criteria for those. The other one is the SRS scheme, early entry, principal's recommendation scheme. If you've had um, children go through earlier years would, you would hear all of those different terms and that as I said is just getting that second bite of the cherry which I mentioned before. These are the institutions that were part of that last year that allow UAC to process that early entry for them on their behalf. University of Wollongong does not. They do it themselves to the side and they close a lot earlier. And so it's important if you're not looking at one of those institutions <coughs> to check out the one that you are inter interested in and see if they've got a separate application process and early entry, uh, which is really important to do that. But I don't know why you wouldn't do it if you weren't able to do it. It w is, again, the message for that side of things. So there's just a little bit of a snapshot of, of the general support as well as some specific support. But the takeaway for your 11s in the room is start the process early. Start getting on, looking at courses, narrow things down, start eliminating what you're not interested in at the very least. And then when people sit down with you and go, what are you interested in? You've got some broad areas to start with. Uh, and the other key element that I would suggest is talk to the students who've finished recently about how they've experienced or what their experience is at the institution that they've gone to that year or two years before or three years before and was the course what they thought it was. So really engage in those conversations that you've got access to with those people. But otherwise, we're here to help. As I said, Chris Ryrie will be a really key support this year. Um, and as I said, Sue Sell, myself, Daryl, Kelly Wilson, people like that, we've all been through that before. So don't hesitate to approach any of us. Are there any quick questions about that before I hand back to Daryl? The schooling one, that, that we don't do it, it's done by UAC. They pick up and they know we're located here and, we've got, and there's a code that gets put in for that. So that one you don't actually have to apply for. It's absolutely taken care of on behalf of all the students. And probably the other quick piece of advice too is that all students, I think, should at least consider the application process to apply for university. Whether you take it or not, it's up to you whether you defer for a year, and there's a few courses that you can defer for two years, not many, but a few, that's fine. Give yourself some thinking time. But I can recall my own experience in year 12. I was determined to never go to university. Never. And I only finished last year. So, you know, things change. Um, and so I think give yourself those, those opportunities and then withdraw if you feel like that, that was the right decision. But you don't know. You don't always know. All right, thanks. Back to you. Um, so just some closing remarks. I've just got... Um, this, I've got a couple of, just to lighten the middle a little bit, to, to make it a bit easier to, in terms of trying to put something into a nutshell. And this, I think, uh, really epitomises what the HSC, well, at least was like for me and probably some other people in the room, you do hit walls, but you just keep going. Um, and while we're on, the, on that subject, so how to sabotage your own HSC, and I'll let Wiley Cody demonstrate that. Uh, but effectively, there's a couple of things we need to consider, and this is sort of a summary, and I know Cathy's already mentioned some of this as well. So it's your HSC. So in order to improve, so this is things that you, you could do to sabotage your HSC. Not asking for advice from subject teachers, anyone else around you, as Dr. Bill is saying, there's people in the room that can actually assist you. Um, if you leave things to the last minute, that's really bad, which is why we have the school policy of the um, preliminary submission. So we want you to submit something a week before that's almost complete. That's why that exists, to prevent you from leaving everything until the last minute. A fixed mindset, as uh, Mrs. Sell and uh, Mrs. Cronin was talking about, so just knowing that you can improve. And I, many students go, I can't do that or I'm not going to get that. And my standard answer to that is, of course we won't with that attitude. 
So you've got to have that right attitude and, and really hope that you can actually work towards that. And if you don't get it, that's okay. But if you don't feel, if you don't think you're going to be able to get that, you'll never get there. Um, being disorganised, being really organised, having a diary, whether it's electronic or, or something that's a physical diary, is really, really important. Um, a holiday after you finish term three. So often term three comes in uh, term three and you finish school, then you've got about three or four weeks before the HSC begins. If you go and sun yourself in Bali for three weeks and then come back, that's probably not a good idea. So it's sco uh, school's over, but not really because you've got this HSC thing to deal with as well. Early entry, it's not really, I mean, it's a good thing, but in, in essence, sometimes it's a bad thing because it's sort of like getting to just about getting to the end and then I've got early entry, so ah, whatever about the HSC. But keep in mind that what you get in for early entry may not be exactly what you really want. So it's really important to keep the accelerator on to, to finish what you've started and finish the HSC and get a really good result as the best that you can so that you have more options. So our student, uh, our, our um, student got the highest ATAR last year. Um, she knocked down medicine. She went to do Bachelor of Law. Um, so she had an option of doing medicine and didn't, didn't want to do that. So having options um, is really important and you have more options the higher your um, ATAR is if you're choosing to go to university. And worrying about perceived inequities, and Mrs. Cronin mentioned this, don't worry about what anyone else is, is going through. Some people will have misadventure, illness. They are going to get extensions on, on, on assessment tasks. That's not for you to worry about in terms of, oh, they got th two weeks extra and that sort of thing. Just focus on what you can do and how you're going, and that's really important. It's your race, as Mrs. Cronin said. It's the marathon that you're running, and no one else can run that for you, apart from yourself. And that's just basically because it's someone yelling at something. Okay, so uh, thank you very much and uh, I'll take questions. Uh